All right, folks, I want to take a bit of time to respond to some comments on the video titled Fake Sword Defense Fail that I put up previously because I feel there is some good potential for open discussion here. So we're going to start off with this one. Way to pick the goofiest videos to evaluate an entire dojo by. This was actually the point why I did not look him up. Jeffrey Prather, because I specifically did not want to make generalized statements about the dojo, the art overall, anything like that. I just want to look at what are we seeing here and how does it stack up in terms of functional mechanics and martial viability. Makes a few other points here. Himo uses a lot of protective equipment. Uh, you can go a lot harder when you have protective gear. This is not about how hard you go. What I was talking about in the demonstration, I acknowledge that it's just demonstration. It's obviously not sparring or anything. And of course, you have to do it in a controlled manner with a somewhat compliant partner. My problem is, is that he moved at a very different rate than the people that he demonstrated on. And the problem is, if a technique only works if you're assuming that you're faster, that you basically have superhuman speed and the opponent doesn't, that's where we run into problems. Like the time it takes to move in, for example. Now, I will say the first technique that I commented on, I was a little harder on it than I could have been. I have absolutely no problem with slow movements in technique demonstrations and drills, etc., etc. It's all good. But you need to stick to a certain tempo. You need to move at the same pace and you can't take shortcuts. You can't boost your own speed. And you need to keep in mind, okay, so the opponent is performing one action. I can perform one action. If I do it right in a real fight, I may be able to do one and a half actions or maybe two if I push it, if, if I do it really well and the opponent hesitates for the opponent's one action. If you do three actions for the opponent's one action, like I explained in that video, it's not going to happen. A demonstration or a drill doesn't need to happen at 100% speed to be realistic, but it still needs to be realistic with what it postulates, with how somebody moves and how you can respond to that. So he says, the log is taken out of context. <sighs> I mean, okay, I'm not familiar with Bujin Khan, Taijutsu, ninjutsu, whatever. I, I can barely keep the names apart. Fair enough. But if I see something like this, I mean, if this is meant just for fun, you know, I've done videos just for fun, obviously. In that case, there's really no harm in me poking fun at it, right? If, like, if somebody mocks Master Ken, which is a parody channel, it's not valid criticism, but it's probably not supposed to be, and it's still entertainment. So... I don't really see a problem with that either way. If it is serious, on the other hand, here's another thing to consider. The context thing is something that other commenters have pointed out as well. And that is fair. Now, when I decided not to look this guy up before I comment on it, that's the downside of that. You know, not getting the context, which could potentially explain something. But... Here, here's something to consider. If you are putting up a public video on YouTube, you can't expect people to know a very specific context that is specific to just this art. If they're not a student of that art, they wouldn't know it. So if you want people to understand it correctly, you have to provide that context and explain it. Otherwise, people might take it at face value. If this was a private or unlisted video for students of that dojo, that would be a completely different story. But because it's public, you know, that ties into something else that he said. What if someone decided to put up a non-stop reel of every goofy thing you've ever put up on the internet? I mean, uh, that sort of has happened. Not, not an entire reel of everything, but yeah, I've, I've received my fair share of criticism, mockery, etc. Sometimes warranted, you know, sometimes, yeah, I've, I've done and said stupid things as a fallible human being, and some of my videos are definitely worth criticizing, especially the older stuff, and yeah, mocking it is, is kind of fair game, because by putting yourself out 
in the public space, if you will, you know, by, by putting out public content, you open yourself up for responses, criticism, mockery, etc. Now, should that should those responses, that criticism and everything, should that be ideally civil and, you know, again, attacking the arguments rather than the person? Yes, of course. Uh, we should ideally be respectful and just, you know, have a, a reasonable discussion and this and that and the other. That doesn't always happen. I mean, I will freely admit myself, I could have also been more polite and respectful in that video. I was, I was making fun of him. Um, because this was something that I saw as worthy of a bit of, you know, poking and a bit of sarcasm and all that. Well, I might have gotten a little carried away at times, you know, gone into full entertainer mode, so to speak, where you crank it up a little bit for fun. I honestly don't think it would have been half as entertaining if I had been completely neutral, detached, polite, respectful all throughout. Uh, there's other types of videos where I try to do that, like this one right here. The same commenter went into a lot more detail. I can't even fit all of that on the screen, but I'm just going to comment on a few things here. If you really want to criticize actual Bujinkan weapons techniques, I don't. In short, I don't. That was not the point. I was not trying to make a statement about Bujinkan or, or any specific art or the dojo or anything like that. I was commenting on those particular techniques that were being shown. Bujinkan is based on forms. It's not until you get into the higher Q levels and black belt levels that they insert fluidity. It's not about fluidity. Again, I have no problem with breaking up a movement into certain points. You know, like, okay, so you, you do... For example, if I was to describe to a HEMA student how to defend against a, a sword cut by pairing and countering, I'll say, okay, first you raise up to guard, you catch the opponent's strike on your blade, you let it push through, you roll it around, then you counter. Of course you have to break it up into step one, step two, step three. That's fine. I have no problem with that. My problem, like I mentioned earlier, was moving at a different rate than the opponent and sneaking in extra time that you wouldn't have. Bujinkan doesn't record well because its original implementation was more as an evasion form of hand-to-hand -hand and arm fighting than a smash and kill you battlefield art. That's fine. It's all about getting out of your opponent's sight range and slipping in hidden strikes that they weren't expecting. Again, I don't have a problem with that. That's fine. But you can still demonstrate that. You can still also, it's not just about demonstration, it's also you have to test it. At least that's my point of view. You can't just you can't just do a bunch of forms that you never ever test out against a resisting non-compliant opponent. If all you ever do is practice with someone who gives you 100% compliance, which you need in order to really get the technique down. That's fair, but if you then if you don't know how to apply it under duress, if you're getting pressured if the opponent doesn't want to let you do the thing then you will never know if it works quite frankly here's an interesting point and other commenters have mentioned that as well that low blow isn't a pain compliance strike it's actually the kose form aimed at shifting the hip bone it isn't actually centered it's off center yeah that's good to know i did miss that when i commented on it, it looked like just a punch to the balls if it's supposed to actually strike the hip bone and shift that, yes, now you're working with something that can disrupt the opponent's posture, that can break their structure, and then you can follow up with something. That I have no problem with. My problem is more, how do you get there and how do you, how do you prevent yourself from being cut to pieces by the opponent in the attempt to get in there? Multiple attackers with a naginata is more of a Japanese training method that you would call functional self-defense. In Sebaki, with appropriate protection and free form, it would probably look nothing like that. If it looks nothing like that, then why would you practice it like that? This is the now I totally understand that a technique that you practice is not going to look as clean in sparring. It doesn't in Hima either, usually. Like the way you practice, the way you spar. It's going to look a bit different. Yeah, the footwork is not going to be as clean. The form is not going to be as perfect. 
Of course, well, unless you keep practicing and practicing. If you get to a high enough skill level, you can pull off things in sparring and make them look pretty damn smooth too. But the problem is it should be as close as possible. Maybe this is just a difference in philosophy, you know, Western thinking versus Eastern thinking. But the issue that I see here is whatever you keep practicing the most is what your body remembers. You know, muscle memory isn't the greatest term, but that's basic. That's what you default to. What you've done the most, what your body is most familiar with is what you will do, what you will, your body will do automatically at a certain skill level. So if you keep practicing this, you know, shoving people around and expecting them to be all limp and collapsing and bonking into each other and falling down, then your body will expect that in a real life situation with a resisting opponent and you will get destroyed. That's how I see it. Another commenter pointed out that this is supposed to represent a kanabo or tetsubo, which is the, the large studded wooden club that you have in Japanese martial arts. That would make more sense. To, but the thing is, this this large log, the way you handle that is very different from the way you would handle a kanabo. And so, okay, let's just assume for some reason this guy is, is chopping wood, you know, felling trees in the woods, and he just has a log at hand, and some, some renegade samurai comes along and wants to mess with him, and okay, fine. I would still do that quite a bit differently and more safely than what was being shown. Like, you know, dodging, and like I pointed out, he didn't even dodge far enough to prevent his hand from being cut. And again, he moved at a much faster rate than the guy with the sword. The guy with the sword actually moved extremely slowly and even stopped at a certain point while Jeffrey Prather was still moving, was still doing his thing. It's out of sync. That's actually a better way of saying it. It needs to be in sync, which this wasn't. So, but even then, like if you actually have a log with you, this is something that a swordsman can't just parry, okay? So if you swing the log, if you hold on to it, you know, wrap one hand around and swing it with your torso, you might actually be able to deliver a, a strike that you can recover from because you're moving it with your entire body. And guess what? If you're swinging this diagonally rather than straight down, this is a lot harder for the opponent to evade. Plus, with such a large, heavy item, you could just blow straight through the swordsman's cut. So you can interrupt them and strike them. Here's another comment about how techniques are practiced in ninjutsu. I can only go by what people tell me because I have not practiced it. I have a friend who practices uh, ninjutsu, and uh, I, I'll definitely tell you that he could really mess somebody up if he wanted to. I'm sure of that. But... Again, I'm not talking about the entire art. I'm talking about specific techniques and even more specifically, interpretations of those techniques. I'm talking about those demonstrations that I saw in that video right there. I'm not trying to criticize anyone who practices Bujinkan or what have you. It's not about painting with a broad brush. These fragmented moves that you're talking about are f intentional for our training. It's not right or wrong. Okay, um, how is it intentional? Again, I totally understand breaking something up into multiple steps in order to be able to learn it and practice it. But at some point, you've got to connect the dots. You know what I mean? And you, you have to, again, try it out against somebody who doesn't want you to do the thing. So you can figure out, is your interpretation correct? Is your technique good enough? Are you able to execute it? Basically, to me, this is the difference between studying for a, a driver's exam and using a, a driving simulator and being actually on the road driving a vehicle. You need those. You need the theory. You need to, you need to, you know, practice in, in a simulator can be very helpful. You need all that. But once you get out on the road and are in the vehicle and people do things that you might not expect, and et cetera, et cetera, you need to be able to apply those things that you've learned in the real world. 
And if those don't match, if they don't fit into the real world because they are so abstracted or artificial in, in their setup, then you're not going to be able to translate that. Here's another comment. What you're seeing here are components that might be useful demonstrated. It's not an actual thing you can reliably do in an actual combat situation. It's something you learn as a tool to use and improvise with. Again, no problem with that. I agree with that. It makes sense. But the staff thing. Why would you practice kicking up a staff onto another guy's staff or worse slide a staff that's lying on the ground with your foot against somebody who's who has the, the staff standing on the ground when is this ever going to happen there might be situations where you can kick up i don't know sand or rock or what have you maybe a disarm happened and you want to kick the weapon up to get it more quickly than having to you know bend over and pick it up stuff like that okay but why would you spend time on practicing that on something so hyper specialized that chances are it's not even going to happen? Why not take the same practice time and put it into high percentage maneuvers? Let's say you spend a hundred hours practicing strikes and such with the staff and you spend 20 hours practicing kicking it around or shifting it around on the ground. Wouldn't you be better off practicing 120 hours on strikes and parries and things that happen regularly? Keep in mind, the art itself is different than what he's actually teaching. Butch and Confronts exist everywhere, sadly. Uh, people teaching bullcrap under the name of Hima or Kenjutsu or whatever is an issue in nearly every martial art. That is very true. That's exactly what I was not making uh, overgeneralized statements about the entire art. You cannot presume that somebody is going to be do this completely rigid robot like movement where it goes and then they immediately freeze as soon as you do that for the technique practice you can do it that way but you have to in your mind you have to think this is not what's actually happening in a real life situation so you need to be able to do something that prevents the opponent from acting so again structural structurally disabling them grappling taking them to the, to the ground etc etc but again you need to do it in sync and you need to do it with mechanical advantage if you're trying to grab someone's arm and apply a joint lock or throw them or whatever if they tense up and pull you need to be able to do something about that you can't just expect to be able to just you know pose them like an action figure you need to be able to you know destroy their balance or push when they pull pull when they push or find a way to exert more leverage on them so you have mechanical advantage to move them even if they didn't want to uh, or you use two arms on one etc etc a lot of it isn't supposed to be used in actual combat scenarios but is more of an exploration of options and a study of biomechanics i have no problem with that again as long as the biomechanics are sound with the pole sweep the pole isn't necessarily a pole it could be a rake or something similar the example is if a ninja is disguised as a gardener and needs to subvert an old man that is onto him <sighs> Again, th this is too specific. In fact, to my mind, this is kind of the opposite of puzzle pieces or tools for the toolbox, etc. because this is way too specialized. If you have general tools, like for example, if you practice movement that allows you to quickly go from cover to cover, that you know allows you, for example, I've, I've seen some demonstrations of footwork that is intended to get out of out of a person's line of sight as quickly as possible sidestep and, and go around them so that as they turn their head basically you keep moving with it and, and move it. stuff like that all fair and good that's fine the the whole rake thing like even in this particular situation um if an old man on a staff comes along like do you really need to practice this like if you wanted to go about training this way you would have to practice five million techniques for 
so many different situations that are highly specific that there's no way you can pull off any of them because you spread yourself too thin. Now, if you're doing drills or games or whatever to train body control, you know, exercises to improve your balance, your hand-eye coordination, etc., and you come up with some artificial setup for that, perfectly fine. No issue with that. But this was the teacher demonstrating something. It does not look like this was a situation where they were just practicing to improve their body control. This whole video consisted of a number of things that were the, well, he was basically showing off his skill. That, that's how it came across. Uh, maybe I misinterpreted how it was intended. I don't think I did, but yeah. Yeah, that's really the thing. Like if, if you take it the way it's shown a, as a fighting technique, then yeah, it, it doesn't make sense. Maybe I'm just too ignorant to get the big picture. Maybe it's such a huge intricate puzzle that it just goes right over my head. But I honestly cannot imagine any way in which this would possibly ever factor into something that could happen in real life. When fighting someone on the street, it could be a distraction. I believe it depends on the situation. Uh, simply kicking your shoe into someone's face would give you a second to do something else. Just like throwing your sword would be a valid last-ditch effort. Okay, yes. But, again, it's so situational that I don't think this... In like, I don't think you need to practice kicking your shoe off. I mean, okay, maybe you do. <laughs> you, because you need to loosen up the, the laces, otherwise you're not going to be able to kick it off. But it's really, this is a setup for something. The distraction is the setup, and then you need an actual technique. If the distraction is the technique, anyway, this is getting way too long and rambly. So again, my intention is not to attack a specific art, like overall, just, you know, paint it with a broad brush and just say, oh, okay, this is, this is garbage. I'm just, I was just, poking fun at specific techniques the way they were shown because I found it funny. I found it entertaining. So I hope you found this discussion interesting. Let me know what you think. Thanks for watching and have a good one, folks.